Well, as we gather together to hear God's Word, I invite you to open a Bible to Mark chapter 2 in our Gospel reading as Jesus teaches us about Sabbath rest. And so this morning we begin a new sermon series called Unhurried, and it's all about finding rest. We, we live in a day and age, we live in a world where being busy is not just something to brag about, but it's the norm, right? How many of you feel busy? He's got a lot going on, right? Usually when you are at a party or a dinner party and you're hanging out with people and everybody's asking each other, how are you doing, right? One of the main answers you're going to get is good or fine because they don't want to talk about it, right? The other main answer you're probably going to get is, I'm busy, right? I got a lot going on, just one thing after another, right? Or if they really want to be honest about how busy they are, they'll say, I'm tired, right? Because that's the result of being busy, always going, always doing something. And we know rest is good for us, right? How many of you know that rest is good for you? How many of you are getting enough to feel better, right? Like we, we know this is a struggle, right? Because there's this pressure on us to what? To stay busy, to keep going, to keep doing things, to fill our calendars, to fill our timelines up, and to always be going, always be doing, and then we'll rest a little bit later. But that later usually never comes. We get exhausted. And so what we want to do over the coming weeks is study God's Word to learn how do we actually practice what the Bible calls Sabbath rest. How do we actually show a little obedience to God's command for us to rest because he knows it's good for us? And how do we learn how to slow down, whether it's in our spiritual lives, our relationships, our work lives, wherever it might be, that we can actually learn to pause and breathe again and find some rest. So as we talk about rest this morning, what we want to talk about is also trust. Because ultimately, not resting comes down to not trusting, right? Not trusting that it will get done, right? How many of you put pressure on yourself to keep going, to fill up the calendar, to be busy, to not rest because something needs to get done? Show hands of honesty, right? You're like, it's got to get done. And guess what we tell ourselves? No one else is going to do it, right? It's necessary. It has to get done or the entire world will cease to exist. Now, that's an exaggeration, but what do we convince ourselves of? It's got to get done, right? We put this pressure on ourselves. Other people put our pressure on ourselves. We got to get done. We got to keep going. We got to keep doing, right? And you learn this from a very early age in school. It's called group projects, right? The whole point of a group project is to what? Teach you teamwork, work together. There's this myth that teachers tell us. I love teachers. My grandparents were teachers, right? But they tell us that if you work together, it'll be easier, right? There'll be less for you to do. No, some of you already told me, no, like I didn't make that up. Okay, <laughs> like, right? Because from life experience, what do we know? That's a lie. It's just not how things work. Group projects turn into what for the overachiever? More work for you. Because there's always someone in the group that's like, I don't care what the consequences are, I'm not doing a thing. And then you have that pressure on you of like, well, it's got to get done, right? So you end up doing it all. Now that's funny and we laugh about it when it comes to a school project. It's not so funny and it becomes more of a burden in life when we continue to live that way at work with our friendships, with our families, with everything else, right? We continue to have that mindset of, if it's gonna get done and it needs to get done, no one else is gonna be doing it. I don't, I, I don't trust anybody else to do it as well as me, so I'm gonna what? I'm just gonna do it all. I don't have time to rest, I don't have time to take a break. It's gonna be me, I'm gonna do it, right? And we even have phrases where this, if, it's, if you want something done right, you, you got to do it yourself, right? You're, you're all so experienced in this, right? Because if I let you do it, it's just not going to be done right. Because I am the Lord of doing it right, right? Like, that's what we think. That's what we tell ourselves. No one else can do it as good as me. No one else can do it right. So I am going to do it myself because I, here's the other flip side of it, do everything right. 
we're perfect. Now, how many of you actually do everything perfectly? Yeah, not a lot of hands popping up, right? Because when we, we lie to ourselves, we say, oh, I gotta do it, right? And so we just tell ourselves, I'll do it myself. So I grew up in a family of engineers and math people. Now, most of you know me, I can't do math. That way, by to, by to me, like really long time ago, I barely know how to use a calculator on my phone, okay? And I'm not mechanically gifted. When I look at a vehicle, all I think to myself is, it's a vehicle, right? I pop the hood open because my wife will go, well, maybe you could fix it to save some money. And I'm like, that's right. I'm the man of the house. And I go out there and I pop that hood and I go, it's an engine. I don't even know what's it supposed to be in here, what's not supposed to be in here. It's, it's whatever. But what I'm thinking to myself is what? Well, I'll do it. Like, I, I could do it. I don't need someone else's help. All right, I'm, I'm going to do it. Usually what this turns into is me making a video on my phone of whatever thingamajig is not working right. Because that's what I call every piece of my car. All right. And then texting that video to my brother, my dad, and my stepdad, maybe an uncle to see, like, one of you geniuses who knows how all of these things work will fix it for me. All right. But it takes a long time for me to get to that point where I admit I need someone else to do it. Even though going into it, guess what I already know about myself? I'm not the right person for this. Like, I have no idea what's happening. But we tell ourselves this all the time. that Like, I've got to be the one to do it. If it's going to be done right, I need to be the one that's doing it because only I can do it right. And then we just convince ourselves to always be busy. Filling up our calendar, always keep going. I've got to do this and I've got to do that because if it doesn't get done, disaster will strike. And so it's funny in school, group projects. It feels a lot less funny when you get out of school <laughs> if we're all still living that way, right? I don't trust you to get this done. I don't trust this person to get this, so I'm gonna get it done. And I'm gonna exhaust myself to be the one that's always doing it right, always getting it done. I can't allow things to go under. How many of you have ever been given anxiety or worry or stress because something on your calendar went unfilled or unfulfilled? It, like it was on there, you planned it, and it didn't happen. Anybody been stressed out by that? That's how messed up we are, right? We're like, oh, a day off, well, what do we do? Anybody feel weird when you're like, there's nothing here. There's supposed to be something here to keep us busy, and there's not. So what do we do? We don't know, right? Now here's the deal. <clears throat> we do this all the time with ourselves and our other human relationships and work and school and everything, right? Like, I've got to get it done. This is where it goes bad, is we begin to treat our faith and our relationship with God the exact same way. We treat it like it's a group project. And if I'm gonna get things done, and if things need to happen, guess what? I gotta do it, right? Now I know we're in church, and so you're resisting me, and you're like, no, I'm always trusting the Lord and his timing on things, and that he'll accomplish his plans. How many of you have ever rushed God's plans? You're just like, never mind, I've got this. Oh, it, I wanted to do on Tuesday, and you're waiting till Thursday? That doesn't work for me. So what do we do? We take our things into our own hands. Just like we tell other people, we end up telling God, if you want to do something right, you got to do what? Yourself. So we tell God, I'll take it from here. I will get it done. And God's like, I invented this thing called the Sabbath. I actually want you to rest and take some time off. You're like, I don't have time for that. How many of you have ever said to yourself or thought to yourself or told somebody out loud actually, I don't have time to rest or time to take time off? Anybody? Just me, right? You're just like, I gotta, just gotta keep going, I gotta keep going. And so we tell God this, I've gotta do it myself, I've gotta get it done. Well, that's a neat idea, Lord, that you want me to rest. But guess what? I don't have time to rest. Have you seen my calendar lately? 
Have you seen my schedule and all the things that I've got going on, my kids got going on, my grandkids got going on? It's a lot, Lord. I'll rest when I get to heaven. <laughs> right? That's not a good plan. When I was in seminary, one of our professors was teaching us about our need for rest. Just something like we all know, right? Like, like we all know we get overwhelmed and too busy and we need to take a break. We struggle with it. And he was, what he was telling us as future pastors, he said, look, guys, God has told you to take a rest. He has told you to take a Sabbath. And he's like, either you're going to voluntarily do it or you're going to get so run down that God's going to force you to take it. All right. Anybody ever just been exhausted and you just couldn't go anymore? And you're like, well, I guess I'm going to take the day off because you got run down or you got sick or something happened, right? And that's God trying to wake you up to the re reality that you can't keep going all the time. You actually need to rest. Now here's the deal of why is this such a struggle with us even when it comes to God, right? Yeah, we have the same idea, mentality that we have with other people is why do the group projects fail? Because I don't trust you to get it done, right? I don't trust you to do it the right way. And here's the hard part. I know you're in church and you love the Lord, but the reason you and I struggle to rest to take time off is because we're telling God, I don't trust you to be in charge of it all. I don't trust you to take care of it. I don't trust you to be over my calendar. I don't trust you to be over my life. I don't trust you with my family. I don't trust you with my work. Whatever your struggle is, at the root of the issue of not resting is not trusting. So I don't trust my coworkers, so I'm gonna work overtime. I don't trust some things to get done in the house, so I'm just gonna do it myself. I don't trust this is gonna happen because they, they've disappointed me before, so I'm gonna do it myself because that's the only way it's gonna get done and done right way. And then our faith becomes the same thing. Why don't I ever rest? That's because I don't trust that God is actually in control. I don't trust that he's over everything. And the only way things are gonna go the right way, the only way that they're gonna get done the right way or happen at all is what? Is if I take control, if I become the one that's in charge, if I take job, God's job from him. So as we dive into God's word, this is the struggle of us all. It's the struggle of the Pharisees and everybody else in the world. And so in Mark chapter two, there's this argument that happens about the Sabbath. In verse 23 of Mark chapter two, one Sabbath, Jesus was going through the grain fields and as they made their way, his disciples began to pluck heads of grain. So they want a snack. How many of you are snackers? Anybody, right? And it's like, oh, that's the first thing your doctor tells you to do, not do when you need to lose weight, is cut out the snacks. You're like, why do you hate me, right? <laughs> like, what else am I supposed to eat if I'm not snacking, right? The disciples, they're walking with Jesus. They've been traveling all day. They don't have cars, right? So everywhere they're going, they're walking. And so they're like, oh, we want a snack. And they happen to be in a grain field and they're, they're picking some seeds and eating them. When I grew up in Texas, my uh, grandparents in Texas had pecan trees in their backyard. So whenever we were running around playing and you needed a snack, that's what granny told you to do. She's like, there's pecans out there. I'm cooking later. <laughs> Just pick, and so that's what we would do. We would just pick pecans off the ground and eat them. That was our snack, right? And that's what the disciples are doing. It doesn't sound like a big deal, does it? You're like, what's wrong with snacking? Is God against snacking? No, he's not. He's totally for it. Snack away. Talk to your doctor first, right? But spiritually speaking, you're okay. All right. So what is the big deal? Well, the Pharisees see this. And they say to Jesus in verse 24, look, why are they, your disciples, doing what is not lawful on the Sabbath? Now, here's the deal. There is not a single Bible verse saying that what the disciples did is wrong. All right. And they weren't sinning. 
They weren't violating God's word. But what they were doing was violating uh, laws of tradition. All right now, here's the reality that God's people over time had taken the commandments that he had given to them. One of them is, remember the Sabbath day, which is supposed to be a day of rest where God actually commanded his people and got really mad at them if they worked. So you wanna know how seriously God takes you and I resting and trusting him? He put a commandment on it and said, I want you to do this every week. I want you to show that you trust me every week, that I will provide for you every week. And so what happened though, because we're all the same, just like the Pharisees and everybody else, that we, we struggle with trusting God, we wanna take matters into our own hands, they developed extra rules around the Sabbath because they didn't wanna break it. They really wanted to show God, look how good we are. And so over time, they had developed all kinds of extra traditions and rituals that went along with the Sabbath of things you could and could not do. And, different traditions talked about how far you could walk on a sabbath before it was considered work and how many dishes you could clean how much you could cook all kinds of things all right and so when the pharisees see this they're upset why are you breaking this rule why aren't you obeying god now here's what's going on here that becomes the same thing that you and i struggle with when it comes to our relationship with God and our struggle to rest and our struggle to trust him, it's because we think that our faith and our relationship with God is performance-based, right? Just like the way the rest of the world works, right? If you think about work and relationships, if you do good and you work hard, you what? You get rewarded. Right? You get praised, you get accolades, or whatever the reward might be. And so we begin to think this is how it works with God, that, that my relationship with him depends on performance. Doing really good with the rules, doing really good with the commands that he's given, doing really good with being obedient to him. And this is what has taken over in the mindset of the Pharisees that they're panicking over the disciples picking some sunflower seeds and eating them on the Saturday. It's because they're like, you're not performing the right way. You're not being obedient enough. Now here's what happens when we live this way and this lack of trust in God. That leads to, I need to perform for him. I need to do better for him. It leads to one of two things. It either leads to a massive amount of pride because if you're doing good, guess what? You're better than who? Y'all, all y'all, right? Hey, right? that's the mentality, right? That's what the mentality of the Pharisees have here is, we're better than your disciples. Your disciple, why are you even allowing it as a, a disciple maker, as a rabbi, as a teacher, why are you allowing this to happen? Their mentality is we're so much better than you because of how well we are performing for God. Right? Another way of putting it is it's, it's pride, it's arrogance, it's being judgmental. Anybody ever judged somebody before because you thought you were better than them? Yeah, why? Because well, I'm, I'm performing better than you. I don't struggle with the same things you struggle with. I don't struggle with the same sins you struggle with. Now the flip side of this performance-based relationship with God is despair. Because what do you do if you fail? What if, you're, what if you do if you're not doing well enough? Right? Anybody ever struggle with that side of it? So some of us struggle with the side of pride. I'm so amazing. I am so much better than you as a Christian and follower of Jesus. I'm a much better human being. And then some of us struggle with the flip side, which is massive amounts of guilt and shame of just like, I'm never gonna measure up. I'm never gonna be good enough. And both of those are destructive. And at the root of this is this idea of, I don't trust God, so I'm gonna prove to him how good and awesome I am by being obedient and doing everything that I can for him. 
I will earn his mercy. I will earn his grace. I will earn his love. And because that's my mentality, guess what I can't do? Take a day off. I can't say no. I must always be doing what? The good things. I always got to keep going. I got to exhaust myself for Jesus. Otherwise what? I just won't be good enough. I won't measure up. I have this recurring nightmare. My wife knows about this and she always has to calm me down. All right. <laughs> Where I'm in school again. That's part of the nightmare, it's just that I'm in school again, okay? I did school, undergrad and grad school. I've done enough, I'm done with it. But I have this recurring nightmare where I'm back in school again. And I'm in college and I'm supposed to graduate, which is like the expectation of my parents is that you will graduate. Right. And there's all this pressure, and it's getting closer and closer to the graduation date. Right. And there's all this pressure because all the family thinks Mark is going to graduate summa cum laude with all the honors, which I didn't, by the way. It's just fantasy world, okay? All right. All right. And all these honors. And everybody in my family is coming from all over the country to celebrate. Right. It's like, oh, there's so much pressure. And then, a week before all of this is supposed to happen, this is where the nightmare kicks in, I'm told by the school, you don't have enough credits. You are enrolled in this math class. It's always math, okay? <laughs> you are enrolled in this math class, and you didn't know it, and you never showed up, so you have only absences. You didn't do any of the homework. You didn't take any of the tests. You're not gonna graduate. And the nightmare ends with me having to call my mom <laughs> and tell her. Uh, so anyway, I'm like, and then I wake up and I'm sweating and I'm breathing heavy. And my Lauren wakes up because I'm annoying her and she's like, what's going on? I'm like, I'm not going to graduate. She's like, honey, you're in your 30s. You're already done with school. I'm like, oh, oh, thank God. All right. Now, I've, I've done some self-psychoanalyzing on why I have this nightmare because it keeps happening, right? It, I, it, just, it just won't go away. It's because it almost happened. So when I was an undergrad, I had to take a calculus-based physics lab, which sounds just as hard as it sounds, okay? I was the only non-science, non-math major in the class, and I had to take it for my one science credit. It was the only science credit that fit in my timeline to graduate. It was my last semester. Now, I gotta tell you something, guys. I don't know calculus. I don't know physics. That class was brutal. And here's what happened. I showed up and I did all the homework. I did all the labs. The, everybody else in the class would do a roulette on, and draw numbers on who would get me as their partner for that lab. They were rotating me around because they're like, wow, group project, he's not gonna help. So, <laughs> and, and then I'm taking all the tests. Here's the deal. I failed every single homework assignment, every single lab, every single test, but I need this class to graduate. I've already been accepted to seminary. So this, you can tell this is like the root of my nightmare that will never leave my mind. This is, it was really happening. And I went to the professor <clears throat> right before the final exam, Dr. Zock. And I pleaded on his mercy. I said, Dr. Zock, I'm never going to use calculus or physics ever again for the rest of my life because I'm gonna be a pastor. And it's just not in the Bible. <laughs> and I was like, I've already been accepted to seminary on the condition that I graduate. I'd really like to graduate and go to seminary. And Dr. Zock goes, well, you know, Mark, my grandfather was an LCMS pastor. I was like, oh, thank you, Lord. And this was the last class he was ever teaching in college, he was retiring. He, go, he looks at me, he goes, if you get a 20 out of 100 on the final exam, you'll make it to seminary. It was a 200 question final exam. And I'm not good at math, but I don't have to get very many questions right to pass. <clears throat> I call him up after the exams are graded. I'm waiting for the grade. You know, like online, you're, anybody done that refreshing nightmare where you're trying to see what your grades are right before, right? <laughs> I call him up, I'm like, I haven't seen the grades that I passed, I failed. By the way, there's like one week to go before graduation. And he just tells me, 
I wouldn't worry about it. And I was like, okay, I'll try not. Does that ever help anybody when you're worried about stuff? Or somebody goes, I wouldn't worry about it. We're like, well, I'm going to. And I graduated. And I lost some honors that were expected. <laughs> and my parents go, I thought you were going to have this GPA and not this one. I was like, you know what? Praise the Lord. I got a diploma, though, because I never told them about Dr. Zock's conversation. All right. Now, here's the deal. When you and I treat our relationship with God like a performance, like a group project, we're always going to live in fear of, did I score high enough? Did I get the right grade? Did I do enough? Did I measure up? And the good news is you and I get to just go to the Father instead and, and plead for grace and mercy and be like, I didn't measure up. I don't know any of the answers. I'm not going to get it right. I mean, you could tell me I can get the lowest score imaginable. A 20% out of 200 questions, by the way, I later talked to them. I didn't get a 20. All right. <laughs> it was pure grace and mercy that I'm standing here today. All right. <laughs> And you and I can negotiate with God all the way down to say, what if I just get a 20 out of it? What if I just get a 10? What if I just get it right once? And the reality is we're going to live in fear for the rest of the life of, did I actually get 20%? Did, did I actually score high enough? But the way the gospel works is totally different. And this is what Jesus says in... In, in the gospel reading, he, says, he said to them in verse 25, have you ever read what David did when he was in need and was hungry? He and those who were with him, how he entered the house of God in the time of Abathar, the high priest, and ate the bread of the presence, which it is not lawful for any but the priest to eat, and also gave it to those who were with him. What he's saying is like, haven't you ever heard the story about David who on the Sabbath day went into the temple and ate the bread that he wasn't supposed to eat, and instead of being destroyed, you know what God did to David is he showed him mercy. He showed him grace and said, this is what you need to live because they were traveling and they were famished and they were starving. And this is how the gospel works. This is what Jesus is teaching as he's flipping it around, saying it's not performance-based. It's not about getting it right and being busy for God and doing more and more and more until you're exhausted. It's not asking him, like, how, how high of a score do I have to get? It's simply just saying, I'm not going to get it right. I've missed a lot of questions. I've messed up a whole lot of commands. I've been disobedient in so many ways. Could you give me grace and mercy? And the good news is that's what God does. That's how he operates. It's what he did for David. David broke the law, did what he wasn't supposed to do. And in the middle of it, God said, here's the grace and mercy that you need. And that's what Jesus is saying. That's what the invitation of Sabbath rest is for you and I. He said to them in verse 27, the Sabbath was made for man, not man for the Sabbath. What Jesus is saying is the Sabbath is meant to be a gift to you and me, not a demand. Not something that you and I have to check off a list as a performance act saying, see, Lord, I did another good thing for you. He gave it to you and me as a gift so that you and I would be able to rest and go, it's going to be okay that I'm not God, that I'm not in control over everything. It's going to be okay if things are left undone because God is the one who's in control. He is God. Martin Luther says it this way. He says, the law says, do this, and it is never done, right? It's that the performance-based mentality. Do this, and do this, and do this. Stay busy, keep doing more. And then here's the reality though, is it's never done. How many of you are tired sometimes? and you're exhausting yourself, and you keep filling up your calendar, and you keep doing more and more and more, and what do you realize eventually? There's always what? One more, right? Meaning what? It's never done. And it's the same thing with our faith, our relationship with God. It's a, do this and do that, and it's never done. But Luther goes on, he says, but grace says this, believe this, and everything is already done. That's the whole point of the gospel. 
No, it's not that I, I come to God and I, and I negotiate with what kind of score do I need to pass, but it becomes I come to God in, in total mercy and in need of his grace and forgiveness and say, I, I believe in you. I believe that you're God. I believe that you're in control of everything. I believe that you're over all things. And the good news of the gospel is that it says it's already done. And this is what Jesus says on the cross. When he's hanging on the cross, one of the last things he says is, it is finished. It is done. It's completed. All the work that you and I need to do in order to please God, to fulfill all the commands, is already done. So that you could take a deep breath and go, oh, <laughs> I don't have to do more. I don't have to do extra credit. I don't have to work a little bit harder. I don't have to keep busying myself to make God love me and be pleased with me. All I do is trust in the cross, believe in Jesus, and it's already done because that's what he declares from the cross. It's already done so you and I can rest. So the good news of Jesus, the good news of our faith is that it's not actually a group project. Jesus did all the work for you and me. So all you and I have to do as Christians is rest in his grace and go, it's already done. God already loves me. God has already forgiven you. God has already given you all the grace and mercy you will ever need. It's already finished. Let's pray. Lord Jesus, we give thanks for your grace and mercy, for the good news that we can rest knowing that you already love us perfectly. You have already forgiven us. You have already done all the work necessary so that we may simply rest in your grace and love each and every day. Help us be people who share that good news with the world around us, a world that is exhausted and busy, to let them know that you love them and forgive them and have done all the work for them as well. In your name we pray, amen.